Reading the prologue from the new biography, King, A Life, by Jonathan Eag. On December 5, 1955, a young black man became one of America's founding fathers. He was 26 years old and knew the role he was taking carried a potential death penalty. The place was Montgomery, Alabama, former capital of the Alabama slave trade. On this day, four generations since the Civil War ended slavery, Montgomery remained a fortress of white supremacy. It was a bastion of the Ku Klux Klan whose members had endorsed and participated in Alabama's 360 lynchings since Reconstruction. A nervous crowd of 5,000 gathered, filling a big Baptist church and spilling onto the streets. Angry and frightened, they were bracing to challenge an America where black people were at risk of murder for a casual glance, where the legacy and reality of racial subordination pervaded the land as proven from lunch counters to oak trees. As the young black man prepared to speak, his purpose remained unclear to the protesters and to him. Would he urge them to stand down as others had done or stand up and resist? His voice lacked the fire of a call to arms. We are here this evening for serious business until it didn't. We are not wrong in what we are doing. If we are wrong, the Supreme Court of this nation is wrong. If we are wrong, the Constitution of the United States is wrong. If we are wrong, God Almighty is wrong. For most of the 5,000, it was the first time they had heard the voice of Martin Luther King Jr. Before King, the promises contained in the Declaration of Independence and the U U.S. Constitution had been hollow. King and the other leaders of the 20th century civil rights movement, along with millions of ordinary protesters, demanded that America live up to its stated ideals. They fought without muskets, without money, and without political power. They built their revolution on Christian love, on nonviolence, and on faith in humankind. This book tells the story of the man who, in a career that spanned a mere 13 years, brought the nation closer than it had ever been to reckoning with the reality of having treated people as property and secondary citizens. That he failed to fully achieve his goal should not diminish his heroism any more than the failure of the original founding fathers diminishes theirs. To help readers better understand King's struggle, this book seeks to recover the real man from the gray mist of hagiography. In the process of canonizing King, we've defanged him, replacing his complicated politics and philosophies with catchphrases that suit one ideology or another. We've heard the recording of his I Have a Dream speech so many times we don't really hear it anymore. We no longer register its cry for America to recognize the unspeakable horrors of police brutality or its petition for economic reparations. We don't appreciate that King was making demands, not wishes. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. He said that summer day in 1963, as he stood at the foot of Abraham Lincoln's statue. We've mistaken King's nonviolence for passivity. We've forgotten that his approach was more aggressive than anything the country had seen, that he'd used peaceful protest as a lever to force those in power to give up many of the privileges they'd hoarded. We've failed to recall that King was one of the most brutally divisive figures in American history. 
attacked not only by segregationists in the South, but also by his own government, by more militant black activists, and by white Northern liberals. He was deliberately mischaracterized in his lifetime, and he remains so today. King was a man, not a saint, not a symbol. He chewed his fingernails. He shouted at the TV during quiz shows. He hid his cigarettes from his children. He had a little white dog named Topsy. He bore a scar on his chest where, in 1958, surgeons extricated an ivory-handled letter opener lodged beside his aorta. He had skin so sensitive he couldn't use a razor. He slept poorly but napped well. He ran chronically late for meetings. As an adolescent, he twice attempted suicide, although perhaps half-heartedly. As an adult, he was hospitalized repeatedly for what he called exhaustion and others described as depression. He possessed a wicked sense of humor, improved by the knowledge that certain jokes were funnier coming from a Baptist minister. He depended on his wife, Coretta, in ways few people understood at the time. He also cheated on her continually, even when he knew the FBI was tapping his phones and bugging his hotel rooms, trying to destroy his marriage and reputation. He maintained one intimate relationship for so long that friends referred to the woman as his second wife. <laughs> he was a man who announced at an early age that God had called him to act. He lived his life accordingly, and he was willing to die. Martin Luther King Jr. has been the subject of excellent biographies and exhaustive scholarship, but even now the literature remains incomplete. This book is based on thousands of recently released FBI documents and tens of thousands of other new items, including personal letters, business records, White House telephone recordings, oral histories, unaired television footage, and unpublished biographies and autobiographies of people close to King. This is the first biography to make use of thousands of pages of material that belonged to the man who served as the SCLC's uh, official historian, L.D. Reddick, that is, official historian, as well as the first to benefit from the discovery of audio tapes recorded by Coretta King in the months after her husband's death and an unpublished memoir written by King's father. This book is also built on hundreds of interviews with people who knew King, including family members and close friends, many of them willing to speak more openly than ever, thanks to the passage of time. The book represents an attempt to observe King's life as it was lived, and through that life, to better understand his times and our own. The portrait that emerges here may trouble some people, but those closest to King saw his flaws all along and understood that his power grew from his ability to grapple with con contradiction, to wrestle with doubt, just as his biblical heroes did. Great men have not been boasters and buffoons, wrote Emerson, but perceivers of the terror of life and have manned themselves to face it. King faced it and challenged his followers to face it too. He asked his supporters to love Birmingham lawman Theophilus Eugene Bull Connor, FD, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, and others who enforced the laws and customs of white supremacy. King understood that President Lyndon B. Johnson could be one of his greatest allies and one of his most dangerous enemies. He pushed white liberals to confront their own racist behaviors, even as it cost him their support. King felt despair. He felt misunderstood. But when pressure against him grew and he might have backed down, he stepped up time after time, despite the obvious risk. 
He warned that materialism undermined our moral values, that nationalism threatened to crush all hope of universal brotherhood, that materialism bred cynicism and distrust. He saw a moral rot at the core of American life and worried that racism had blinded many of us to it. He called himself a victim of deferred dreams of blasted hope. He also insisted that we must never lose infinite hope. He never did. <laughs>